Blah. Hi, I'm Curtis Knight. For those of you who don't recognize the name, I was fortunate enough to have discovered, played with, and been a very close friend of Jimi Hendrix. It was perhaps one of the most enlightening times of my life. I stood next to a genius, and it's something that I can never forget. I remember the first time I saw Jimmy was uh, on 47th Street, New York City, at a place called the Hotel America, which is now a parking lot. In the lobby of the hotel, they had a recording studio, and I stopped by there one day. I had some music business to attend to. And standing by the elevator, I saw the most incredible looking guy that I had ever seen in my life. This guy had hair out to here. Now we are talking 1964. Now I'd seen some strange things, but I said to myself, this must be a very special person. So I walked up to him and said, hi, I'm Curtis Knight, what's your name? What do you do? He said, my name is Jimi Hendrix and I play guitar but I don't have one because uh, I just came off the road playing a soul tour and I had to pawn the guitar. I got tired of the soul tour playing in the key of C and G and I pawned the guitar and if they catch me down in the lobby, they're gonna put a key in my room and I won't be able to get back in. I told him, I said, look, I have a guitar out in the back of the car and an amplifier. I had a Fender Super Reverb and a Fender Strat I said, go back up to your room so, they don't, so you don't get locked out. So I went out, I got the guitar and amplifier, took it up to his room, he picked up the guitar, turned it upside down because he's left-handed, and what I heard almost blew me out the door with an atomic blast. I had never in my life heard anyone articulate, play chords, and lead at the same time. I was totally blown away. I had a rock circuit in the city. I had a group called the Squires, and we were playing clubs like Ondine's, which at that time was the end club under the 59th Street Bridge where all the British rockers came. People like uh, the Animals, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles. As a matter of fact, uh, the Rolling Stones are the ones that caused, in other words, they brought Chas Chandler attention to Jimmy. They said, Chas, you gotta check out this incredible guitar player and uh, it was just amazing because we played all of the rock clubs in New York City after we got together. From that day on Jimmy and I were together. I gave him a guitar and an amplifier and we started playing all the, the rock clubs. On Dean's there was a club called the Cheetah and uh, we went so far as to uh, <laughs> go down in the garment district and buy some material that was the same color of the decor in the cheetah. And we had white bell bottoms, I'll never forget it. And uh, that was our uniform there. We were to open at the cheetah, we had about three days off after Ondine's, and suddenly Jimmy disappeared. He wasn't with any of his numerous girlfriends. Uh, he hadn't gotten in touch with me. And he, it was as though the ground swallowed him up. And the next thing I knew, Six months later, I picked up a cash box, and they were talking about this incredible black guitarist that was in England. So what actually had happened, a lot of people don't know this story, what actually had happened was Chas Chandler, who was the bass player of the Animals at the time, was getting a little tired of touring, and he was looking to get into the management end of the business. So, as I said before, going back, he was tipped by the Rolling Stones, Bill Wyman, in fact, to go and check out this incredible black guitar player and he talked Jimmy into going to England. He didn't say anything to me. And uh, the next thing I knew, they were gone. Jimmy didn't tell me either. So the ironic thing about the whole situation is uh, after he made Hey Joe and became a superstar in Europe and came back to the US uh, in 66, the first thing he did was call me up on the phone. And he said, hey, Curtis, guess what? I said, yeah, I know you're a superstar. I said, I need to do it. And he, he uh, asked me to come over to the hotel, and he played me some of the cuts from the latest LP. And this is what a lot of people don't know. That night, after he played, he did his debut at a club called Ones in Greenwich Village, which is now a Shakespeare theater or something like that. Anyway, that night, 
uh, we went to the studio after his gig and we recorded all night. He, you know, he wanted to get back to what we were doing and record with me. And we did two albums that night. And uh, while he was in town, we did another uh, another album. Did about three albums while just before he went to Monterey Pop. He was on his way to Monterey Pop then. The Jimi Hendrix Experience. Those recording sessions, these albums have been released all throughout Europe. As a matter of fact, they're in the stores now. And there was some legal technicality, which is not very clear to me. Uh, they were never released in America. You know, they are legitimate recordings. And at that particular time, Jimi Hendrix and myself were, uh, in fact, when Jimi went to England, uh, he had a recording co agreement not a management agreement. He had a recording agreement with the same gentleman that was managing me at the time. And uh, so that's how we were affiliated. Back in the days, in the early 60s, there were numerous soul tours where they took out six, seven, or eight, sometimes 10 headline artists, people like Jackie Wilson, Wilson Pickett, James Brown. They would all be on the same show. And what they would use was one band, like three or four musicians that would play for the whole band. Very often, Little Richard would be headlining the tour, or Jackie Wilson, depends on who had the hottest hit record at the time. And the role that Jimmy was playing at that time was a background musician playing as a part of a group for all these soul tours. And they were strictly restricted to playing exactly what was on the record. As a matter of fact, if they even moved and tried to dance and tried to outshine the headline artists, I mean, they were in big trouble. So it was a very frustrating time for Jimmy with all this energy in him, with all this music in his head. Subsequently, I met him just after he came off of one of those extended soul tours. Now, these albums that you see with the Isley Brothers, with Little Richard, are things that were done during that period of time. However, Jimmy was never a, an active member of those groups. Jimmy told me the story. He was a paratrooper, which I, I know a lot of people may not know. And uh, the most exciting thing to him was coming out of the plane in the cloud, and he said he'd hear the wind go by him. Whoosh. Now, he was in a club one night, and a very angry, drunk patron was in there and said to him, Hey, look, you're a pretty good guitar player, but I want to see you do something spectacular. So the guy said to him, look, if you don't do something spectacular, then I'm going to take that guitar and break it over your head. So Jimmy had been practicing this, you know, just something to do different. And this was the first time he did it in public. And he got such a rouse innovation that he made it a part of his act. And it even became a thing that later, as Jimmy's stardom increased, you know, there were times when he didn't even feel like doing these things that were so much a part of him and things that people expected, such as playing the guitar with his teeth, with his tongue. And people have often asked me, this said, Curtis, now, did he really play it with his teeth or did he just pluck it? I mean, he actually did solos with his teeth. I mean, he was able to do that. Because I've stood up over him and looked down on the guitar. <laughs> I saw what he was doing. Well, the reason I decided after Jimmy's death, Jimmy died in 1970 at the actual time of his death, September 18th. I was in Paris doing a television show, and I rushed to London as soon as I could get there. And I was very close to the young lady that was with him the night he died, Monica Danneman. So I perhaps know the story better than anybody of what actually happened the night of his death, other than, of course, Monica Danneman, who was there actually with him. Now, when I got there, and we were questioned by a lot of people, I realized there were a lot of very unanswered questions about Jimmy, because he was a legend to some, he was an enigma to a lot of other people, he was a god in some ways to a lot of other people, he was a messenger. He was a messenger to me. He was someone that expressed himself with the guitar, with the lyrics in his songs. Now. If you met Jimmy, if Jimmy was in this room right now, 
and he was acting his normal self, he would be sitting in the corner, perhaps just eating bread. If you saw him on the stage, naturally, everyone knows this, he was like someone out of the jungle or from another planet. He became totally immersed. He's, his personality became an extension of the guitar, but they, they became one. And he did things with the guitar and with his gyrations, etc. that at that time had never been seen before. Jimmy's recording techniques have just now started to be utilized by a lot of people. Firstly, the thing that it did was amazing at the time because there was only eight, 16 tracks, you know, when he first got started. And the thing that he did because he structured a three-piece group, which meant the bass, he always ta taught the bass player, which was Noel Redding, uh, naturally, in the Jimi Hendrix experience, a rigid bass line, a static bass line, a definitive bass line, where the rest of the arrangement would have something to come back, because Mitch Mitchell was a free-form, almost jazz drummer, if you will, a lot of riffs and things, which complemented Jimmy's plan. Now, one of his recording techniques was to record all the rhythm in stereo, okay? And another thing he would do, he would play an octave of the bass line and record that in stereo. So what happened, it gave him a very broad sound. And then, because he had big hands, and this may sound strange, but because of the size of his hands, he was able to do things with the guitar, hold certain strings down, and even the palm of his hand had relevance in terms of certain tones that he would get from the guitar. And as far as his singing recording technique was concerned, he would always put up a screen when he did his vocals because he was still shy and even to the day he died, he never really thought he was a singer. I believe I can project what he would be doing now if he were still alive because we had numerous conversations about that. Unfortunately, uh, because of his uh, business situation, I'll just say that in general terms, he was somewhat restricted in what he really wanted to do. But had he had the latitude that he wanted and he was attempting to get before his death so he could have total control of what he was doing musically, he had spoken with people like Miles Davis. He had received a lot of attention in jazz circles. And what he would have done is he would have brought all kinds of music together. He was into the reggae rhythms, the three and five instead of the two and four. And what he was going to do was encompass all of this with his own inimitable style and come up with something that would be a, mess, a musical message and bring all peoples together via music. So he would have crossed all the styles. He would have, at now as dance, as most music is being written from the rhythm out because you must pay attention to what has happened in terms of beats per minute, in terms of what the, the dance groove is. He would have been writing from the rhythm out also, but he would have been establishing, because he was able to go from country and western, for an example, case in point, Hey Joe, his first hit, was a country and western tune by a group called The Leaves, okay? And instead of taking one of his originals, I was with him when he brought the record, Colony Record Shop on Broadway. He brought the record and took it to England with him. So he would have been in the forefront of bringing music together, which is happening now. Phil Collins, Philip Bailey, everybody's recording with everybody. And it's marvelous. 1986, what has happened to me within the last six months is something that I never thought would happen twice in one lifetime. I have met, to my mind, the most incredibly talented musician and singer since my association with Jimi Hendrix. I never in my wildest dreams believed that I would meet someone of this magnitude, and I could not believe when I met this person that they were not a household name. Though this person is very well known in Europe and known somewhat on the East Coast because, as a matter of fact, he had a group in Europe 
called M80. His bass player is now with Ozzy Osbourne. So that gives you an example of the caliber of musician that he is. But at the same time, being very honest with you, he's known underground, he's a known unknown. In Europe, he's very well known. And I've been managing this person for about six months now, and uh, they've put together an incredible group. The person I'm speaking of is a young musician by the name of Nicky Buzz, who grew up right down the street from Muhammad Ali in Louisiana. He, or in Kentucky, excuse me, Kentucky. He is part black, part Indian, and part Chinese. And perhaps because of the ethnic proliferation, maybe that's the reason that he comes from all the different musical areas that he comes from. His name is Nicky Buzz, and the gentleman that plays with him, the bass player, his name is J.P. Patterson, and together they form a group that I manage called the Midnight Gypsies, and they are hot. The second video is called Wild in the City. And what it does, it epitomizes the pulse of New York City, the naked jungle. It epitomizes the heartbeat, the hope, the frustrations, the desire, the fact that New York can be whatever you want it to be. You can be trapped and be in a situation where nothing good seems to happen, or you can rise above the degradation and all the things that can be negative and be whatever you want to be, because it represents a city of opportunity. And wild in the city is just a reflection of what's happening from one point of view to a lot of people. There's one thing I'd like to say that everyone should be aware. When the midnight hour strikes, the midnight gypsies are on the horizon. If you look to your left, to your right, to the north, to the south, to the east or west, or even if you see a certain star way up there in the galaxy, that just might be the midnight gypsies. I would say the one moment that I shared with Jimmy that personified and epitomized the person is we were playing at a club in Hackensack, New Jersey. At the time, it was called George's Club 20. We had the microphone set up on a beer case, and you could smell the fish frying back in the kitchen. And it was so crowded up on the stage that people were right on top of you. They were shooting pool in another room. And no matter what was happening, the minute Jimmy started his solos, it was as though something happened from another dimension. People would stop still and be mesmerized by what he was doing. For an example, at that particular time, I thought I was pretty hot stuff with the ladies, and I would invite my girl down. Five minutes after they were sitting in front looking at the band, they were not looking at me. They'd be looking at Jimmy. I mean, he had the most incredible amount of charisma that I've ever seen. And he always had a moment 
to explain how he did a run, if some kid stopped him on the street, even when he was a superstar. He always had time. And if he were here today, he would still be following that path. Absolutely.